First Timothy chapter 6. Your Bible may be falling open to that portion of Scripture by now. If, you've, if you're using the same Bible, at least uh, from the time that we started through this epistle. The verses that we're dealing with today in the first part of chapter 6 really are uh, warning verses or verses that are intended to help us Help us deal with problems that arise within the context of the church. And we need these instructions, though uh, sometimes they're, they're difficult to work through and, and sometimes perhaps even difficult to know exactly who is being spoken of as we work through them. But we're going to do the best we can by the aid of the Holy Spirit to understand what the Apostle Paul is getting at here, really what the what God is getting at through the Apostle. Let's read beginning at verse 1 through verse 5. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. Now that, that, you, you can see right off the bat that is a huge, huge issue to the Apostle. And it really ought to be a huge issue to any of us in any aspect of life right there. That the name of God and His doctrine, His, His teaching, be not blasphemed. That's, that should be more important to us than our own name, uh, our, our own prosperity or lack thereof, health or wealth or anything else, sickness, whatever else. Nothing is more important than that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed by us, by our choices in life. And hopefully you have that kind of spirit that's within you. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren. But rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. We're going to be working through those verses. There are a number of details. There's complications in the language that is used. But I think the overall emphasis and point of the apostle is fairly easy to follow, and I hope that that will be what comes across to you by the end of the message. False prophets and false teachers have always been a potential problem for the people of God. Under Moses, the Lord gave this warning to His people in Deuteron reading from Deuteronomy chapter 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and give, gives thee, give it thee a sign or a wonder. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar? So if there arises someone, it gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods. So there's a sign and a wonder, but there's a message that's off. Let's go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice, and you shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And this harsh warning result of how to deal with the false prophet under Moses, under the law. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to you, to, he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. This is serious business, this thing of false prophets, 
false teachers. You come over to the New Testament, and in Matthew chapter 17, it is no less a concern in the New Testament day as in the day of Moses or the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 7, in verse 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And then you have John's warning in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false, many, many false prophets are gone out into the world. So this is not a, um, this is not a, a minuscule problem. This isn't one of those things that will ever now and then you might run across this thing. There are many of them, John says, that were in the world in that day. There were those in Paul's day who masqueraded as apostles. You can read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That they, they put themselves forth as apostles equal to Paul. He warned the apostle Paul, warned of those who would preach another Jesus. He warned of those who would preach another gospel. And nearly 2,000 years of church history has only increased the danger of false teachers. And so the concern about false teachers and false teaching is of no small consequence. Coming back to our passage, Paul is not warning against teachers who simply have wrong understanding, who've missed a few doctrinal points, who, who need to be further taught, more fully taught, like Apollos, you remember, in Acts chapter 18. He had to be taught more fully things pertaining to Christ. But when he was taught those things, the Spirit of Christ was in him, and he understood the error of his way, and he changed his message to fit the truth. That's not a false teacher. That's not a false prophet. He's calling out those whose minds have been corrupted and truth as it is in Jesus Christ has been taken from them. And what they're saying, they're saying for motives that are not pure and motives that do not lead to godliness. As the passage will tell us, elders have the God-given responsibility to guard the church against such intruders, false teachers who sometimes rise up from within us it isn't always from the outside. Paul said that in Acts chapter 20, you remember, as he spoke to the Ephesian elders, some will rise up from among you. And we have to be on guard. And so Paul helps us in our text to identify false prophets or false teachers. They're not always easily detected. He says, if any man, no matter who he may be, if any man, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter if he's been in the church for many, many years. No matter if he has been a leader and you're familiar with him and you like him. Doesn't matter if any man fits the description that Paul gives us here. He's dangerous. And he needs to be viewed as dangerous, dealt with as dangerous. Withdraw yourself, he says. Faithful preachers and teachers do not develop their own system of doctrine. They hear Paul say, these things teach and exhort, the end of verse 2. These things teach and exhort, and they're agreeable to the words of the apostle. They say, yes and amen, that's what we want to do. We're not interested in some new thing. We're not interested in developing something that will be attractive to our generation. We want to teach these things. We want to exhort these things, the things that have been handed down to us from Christ Himself through the apostles. Well, false teachers are different. And they are identified by their message and their character. And that's what you see in verses 3 through 5. False teachers identified by their message and their character. And don't misunderstand. False teachers aren't wrong about everything. That's one of the reasons why it's so difficult. 
to spot some false teachers. They are right, and they may be right about a lot of things, but they're certainly right about some things. If they were wrong about everything, we would easily be able to spot them and deal with them. They're usually very impressive. They're usually very persuasive, usually have personalities that are very becoming, winsome. Powerful individuals, authoritative individuals. But we cannot overlook warning signs that Paul sets forth in these verses. As I've, as I've been meditating on verses 3 through 5, I've actually, as I seek to always do, I've been introspective. I've looked at my own life. I've asked myself questions. Am I a false teacher? Am I a false prophet? I don't want to I don't want to be so blinded, so puffed up, so conceited that I I think it's everyone else and not me. And 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 I'm the man that Paul is identifying. And so it ought to be for all of us. And though this is particularly focused upon those who are false teachers, those who actually are doing that teaching in a false way, the application is really to us all and to us as a church. I hope that we'll all be duly warned and respond well to what the Apostle says. So what is the message of false teachers? He says, if any man teach otherwise. Otherwise than what? The word uh, teach otherwise is, the, is translated back in chapter 1 and verse 3. Teach no other doctrine. It seems strange to say, but the same Greek word is being translated in both places. And translations translate in different ways. You see the King James translates the same word two different ways. Literally, it is teaching otherwise. Teaching something else. Something else than what? What these things teach and exhort. Other things would be that which is not in keeping with what is the apostles' doctrine. And so Paul is saying, if any man teach otherwise, if any man is teaching something that is unfamiliar, which you didn't, you didn't hear from us, it's an unfamiliar sound. Something is off. It's not lining up. It's something other than what has come to us from the authority of Scripture. Have you had that happen before when you're listening to a preacher and they say something and you say, whoa, I've never heard that before. Now, it may be what they're saying is true. But it certainly should be a red flag to you. Investigate. Search that out. Is that fitting the apostolic teaching? You see, they, the false teacher doesn't necessarily deny God. He doesn't reject Jesus. In fact, he may use their names quite freely. But their emphasis is something other than what Paul has called in this letter the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness. Their gospel does not center upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll talk about Him. But they talk about Him to get to something else, as we'll see as the passage unfolds. Paul says, Consent not to wholesome words. Another identification. These are individuals who do not consent to wholesome words. Literally, they don't come to wholesome words. They're not drawn to. They don't move toward wholesome words. What are these wholesome words? These are words that are healthy. These are words that are sound. Those are the ways to translate the word wholesome. In chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul trans... Or, or, <laughs> boy, that was almost a slip. Paul translates... Paul didn't translate this. The translators of the King James translated it this way. Sound doctrine at the end of verse 10. Sound, there's our word, wholesome. In Titus chapter 2, it is sound doctrine. Speak, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Healthy doctrine. Wholesome words. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says that back in our... Back at verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, 
the words of our Lord Jesus Christ or literally those of our Lord Jesus Christ or the ones of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the, the, the healthy words of our Lord Jesus Christ, including all that he said, all that he did, and all that has been communicated in the New Testament. These are words of authority. These are not opinions of a preacher, but they are dogma of Jesus Christ, who spoke only that which was in agreement with his Father. The very Word of God is what he has in view here. He calls it doctrine or teaching, instruction, which is according to godliness. According to godliness. These are not just theoretical words. They aren't lofty ideas. They aren't impressive philosophy. These are not myths and genealogies and academic schemes of thought. These aren't, these aren't words of somebody who is impressing you. They're words of the Lord Jesus Christ that are according to godliness, teaching that connects with and leads to godliness. But you see, false teachers consent not to these kinds of words. They don't come to them. They don't submit themselves to the truth that has been revealed. Their message is not dependent upon the Word of God. Their message is not focused upon the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Their message, their message is not joined with godliness. Their message doesn't lead their hearers to God in Christ or to the life of holiness that results from godliness. You remember what godliness is? We talked about that quite a lot in chapter 4. Remember, remember the comment, don't leave God out of godliness. Don't leave Jesus Christ out of godliness. The mystery of godliness is really a heart and mind that is being drawn to Him. To exercise yourself unto godliness is really to discipline yourself toward Him. And when you see more and more of Him, it will affect your life. It'll change your life. It'll make you healthy and whole because you're feeding upon Him who is wholesome, the wholesome words of Jesus Christ. That's godliness. The false teachers are not that way. Such teachers may have started out solid, but they shifted away from gospel truth and and they dangerously infect churches with unwholesome teaching. These teachers are further identified by some of the common ungodly characteristics that are connected to them in verses 4 and 5. Note the character of false teachers. He says they're proud. He is proud. Puffed up. Self-focused more interested in His own name and fame than Christ and godliness. More concerned about what folks are going to say about Him. Promoting Himself. More interested in reviews than being an humble instrument of Christ. He's one who's going to be promoting His own opinions and His views rather than bringing hearers to the words of Christ. When folks who hear Him go away and they're chewing upon the words of Christ and their lives are conforming more and more to Christ, but they don't say anything about Him, He's disappointed. And He really isn't that concerned even about misrepresenting the Scripture so long as He gains in some way by it. He's, he profits from it in some way. Of course, he would never admit this. Why wouldn't he admit it? He's proud. He's puffed up. It, it, that, that comes from a word that has the idea of a cloud. He, he can't, there's, there's a, a fog over him. He can't see clearly. Pride is like that. It's blinding. And you can't see the truth. And so Paul continues. He's proud knowing nothing. Knowing nothing. This is the truth of his condition. He doesn't admit it. He, doesn't, he wouldn't say that, of course, because he's impressive. And he wants to impress. But the idea of knowing nothing is he doesn't have a proper understanding. Over in chapter 1 and verse 7, it's translated this way in the King James. 
desiring to be teachers of the law. By the way, there's a parallel between what Paul is saying in verses 3 through 5 and what he says in the first chapter. He's talking about these who are in this Ephesian context, false teachers, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither. That's the translation of our word where he says knowing nothing, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. Without true understanding of the gospel. This is critical. This is the heart and soul of a false teacher. He doesn't really understand the gospel. You see, Paul is not saying that he's academically empty. He's not saying that he's illiterate when he says knowing nothing or understanding nothing. What he's saying is that he has no spiritual understanding of truth. The great mystery of godliness is beyond his reach. Something is wrong with him. If he speaks anything true, he doesn't really know of what he speaks. He's simply parroting truth, but he's not speaking it with an understanding. And so whether people get it or not is not the issue. It's not real to him. His efforts really are all about himself. Pride and ignorance are closely linked. It's interesting to see Paul's wording in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. There's a parallel here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verses 1 and 2. He says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. So, so Paul is interested here in more than just knowing something. And as a teacher and as a hearer, it, it's more than just knowing. He says knowledge puffs up. And that word puffed up there actually is related to the word proud in our text. He is proud knowing nothing. Knowledge puffs up. So he knows something, but it's a knowledge that doesn't, that is not connected with love. In other words, there is no life of Christ. There's no spirit of Christ in him. And if in that kind of person, knowledge will simply elevate him in his own estimation. And he really is not interested in anyone else. He's not interested in your benefit and your gain and your profit and in particularly, particularly your drawing nearer and nearer to God. And so he, he says, knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. Charity builds up. And if any man think that he knows anything, any man of this nature that thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing. Yet as he ought to know, he knows nothing. He doesn't have an understanding that is produced by the Spirit of Christ in him. False teachers. He says, but. So here's the contrast. The proud, they don't know anything. They don't understand. They don't really understand the heart and soul of the gospel and the intent of the gospel and the direction of the gospel is, is intended to move the people of God. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. And so he's doting about questions and strifes of words. There's a better translation than doting about. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of doting about questions. The word isn't used. I think this may be the only place it's used in, in uh, the New Testament. And so it's a bit difficult even to translate. But the idea is a morbid obsession. This idea of doting about questions. Morbid, morbidly obsessed with disputes. Questions. Disputes. Disagreements. And wars of words. Strifes of words. The language points to sickness in the mind. The, the word that the King James translate do, translates doting, morbid, 
There's a sickness, there's an unhealthiness, and this fits the context, doesn't it? Because he's not interested in healthy, wholesome words of Jesus Christ. He's not interested because he's sick himself. And he's sick himself because he separated himself from the healthy, wholesome words of Jesus Christ. And he's launched off into questions and strifes of words. Not the words of Jesus Christ, but fringe things at best, or things that he has found, if you go back to chapter 1, things related to the, to the law or genealogies, uh, things that in no way lead to godliness. William Hendrickson translate this, translates this phrase, but doting about questions and strifes of words this way, morbid craving for controversies and word battles. He loves controversy. He's not interested in discussion and teaching that actually leads to some beneficial conclusion regarding one's relation to God or one's relation to others. Paul is not saying, don't ask questions. Paul is not saying, don't have discussions. Paul is not saying, don't even have some difficult discussions. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't become morbidly, morbidly obsessed with this kind of interaction that goes nowhere. This false teacher, or those who are in the frame of mind of a false teacher, just wants to be on the cutting edge of some new idea and contending over meanings of words. I've probably told you this before, but I remember coming home from one of my years in seminary and as a young man and in the kitchen with my mom and or my mama. And, uh, and you know, just, I'm just, you know, I'm going deep, man. You know, this, you know, you got to understand this. You know, I don't even remember what I was talking about. It's been a long time ago. But I was, I do remember her response. As I finished my deep teaching to my mom, she just asked one simple question. What difference does that make? It's like, who cares what difference? Who cares? This is deep. Don't you get it? It's deep. But that's the point Paul is making. That, that's what false teachers are about. What difference does it make in lives, in relationship to God and others, is of no real concern. It's learning for learning's sake. It's teaching to be impressive but never coming to a knowledge of the truth, of the truth as it is in Jesus Christ that will act absolutely transform your life and the lives of those that are being truly taught. See, Paul does have this concern. You know, he writes about it in 2 Timothy in, in the second letter. This form of godliness, denying the power thereof. That's that false godliness that he is concerned about exposing. False teachers are not interested in people being moved to an awe of God in their teaching. I, One of the things that concerns me is that I never say anything that's going to be a misrepresentation of who God is. My, my heart's desire is that when I'm speaking, whether here at the prison or anywhere else, I want people to be seeing who the true and the living God is. I want to be a, I want to be a true and right representation of Him. But a false teacher is not concerned about that. He's not moved to an awe of God. He's not seeking to move others to an awe of God or to a surrender to Jesus Christ or a love for Him. He's not interested in 
truth that's going to affect in some practical way. That is the words of Christ being delivered to people so that they hear what Jesus Christ is saying. To be affected by that. He's proud. Knowing nothing. But doting about questions and strifes of words. Morbid. Craving for controversies and word battles. And notice what this leads to. You see, false prophets, false teachers, as well as false Christianity are not motivated by true godliness. They're motivated by something else. And it's obvious when you see the fruit of what comes from their ministry. Whereof comes, he says. Envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings. Here's the result of his efforts. And Paul strings together words here that in some ways are related. It's almost, it's as if he's wanting to just pile it on here and say, this is what, this is one way that you can identify a false teacher or a false prophet or a ministry. That would fall into this category because this is what results. This person is a disturber of the peace and not in a good way. Would you agree that there is a good way to be a disturber of the peace? You know, you're a troubler in Israel, right? Now, that's not a bad thing. When you're calling out sin and you're identifying um that which God has said He is opposed to and people get disturbed and they're awakened in their conscience and perhaps strike out against you. Well, that's not a bad thing. That's a godly thing. That's a biblical thing. That's what preaching should do as well. But that's not what Paul has in mind here. He's talking about those whose lives are characterized in the church. See, he's not talking about out there. He's talking about in the church, in the company of the saints, and those who are believers. That's where false teachers, by the way, do their thing. False teachers are not targeted on the rest. Uh, uh, they don't target the rest of the world. They target you. And Satan uses them to target you, the people of God. And I would say this as we move along here, that as you're listening to these identifications of false teachers, I hope that you'll in your own mind and heart be thinking, I want to stay clear of this. If this is in any way identifying something about me, I may not be a false teacher, but I may be affected by some of the same things that false teachers are affected by. And so we want to run from that. We want to flee from that. We want to withdraw ourselves, not only from that kind of person, but that kind of thing, that kind of emphasis and the results of false teachers whereof comes he says envy a spirit of rivalry competitiveness not love that pursues peace but envy a jealousy. You know, what about me? That kind of tension. Strife. Contention. Debate. Over every difference. Not differences that truly matter in relationship to godliness. It's just differences. Oh, you don't see it my way. Well, let me... And you just go at it and, and you see that kind of spirit stirred up in a church. And no matter the cost, I'm going to have my way. I'm going to have the last word. Strife. Railings. Slander. Destructive speech. Tearing one another down. Railings. Characterizing one another. Or mischaracterizing one another. But, of course, being proud and knowing nothing, we don't have the ability to properly characterize. And so we mischaracterize. And that goes on. It happens in churches. 
False teachers get a charge out of that. It's almost as if it's almost as if their understanding is that's godliness. Evil surmisings, suspicions, thinking evil, evil conjecture. The truth about one another is distorted and destroyed. I surmise, I suspect, suspect things about you and you of me. This is what is generated under the ministry of false teaching. False teaching. They don't trust one another. We don't trust one another. Isn't that a horrible thing in a church where you get to the place where I don't trust you and you don't trust me? Where can we go from there? Perverse disputings. Continual friction. Continual friction. I mean, I don't have to expound upon how much God loves unity. You know that. And it's been talked about many times from this pulpit and it will continue to be because it is a, it's a, it's of great value to our God. But a false teacher doesn't care about that. The false teacher is all about his own agenda. Perverse disputings are not a problem. So long as he's having his impact, having his way, sway in the church. This is hard-hitting stuff here, isn't it? Well, where's the problem? The problem's internal. Verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. Internal. The problem is the way of thinking. The fountain of thought is fouled by unhealthy surmisings and disputing over subjects that do not pertain to godliness. And that becomes the main thing in the minds of this kind of the mind of this kind of person or persons destitute of the truth. They've been deprived. That that word destitute, it's actually translated in other places in the King James, defrauded. Almost as if something has worked in them to remove whatever truth was in them. That's why I say they may have started out with some Truth, but something has happened to them. Men of corrupt minds, unhealthiness has taken over. They're diseased. There's no longer the wholesome, healthy words of Jesus Christ, the main thing with them. And and godliness is the desire and goal, the exaltation of Christ and, and the life that flows out of a relationship with Jesus Christ but other things. And so the mind is corrupted. The truth has been stolen away. Defrauded of the truth. Presumably by their own minds, pursuing some new thought, some other thing, something different or better than the faith once delivered to the saints. That is the wholesome words of Jesus Christ. By the way, just to throw this thought out, the cure is to get back to the wholesome words of Jesus Christ. I mean, that there's, you know, you want a remedy? You want a supernatural remedy? And yeah, we're, all, we're all into natural remedies. I'm into a supernatural remedy. The supernatural remedy uh, is Jesus Christ, the great mystery of godliness. Wholesome, healthy, sound words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, a false teacher doesn't emphasize that. True godliness is not the goal of false teachers or false Christianity. They're exposed. And here's a way in which perhaps one of the easiest ways for us to spot a false teacher. Supposing that gain is godliness. 
They confuse greed with godliness. We'll say more about this next week as we get into verse 6 because Paul sort of expounds on this some more. But false teachers and false Christianity commercialize religion. Do you hear that? Commercialize religion. How can we profit? And you see, we have this beautifully bound Bible, and you can have the, or we have this book, and just, you know, for this donation, and we have this, and if you'll write us, and by the way, we have a $15 million debt that we've got to pay, so everyone please dig deep this week. I mean, if you've seen it in the news, the folks up there in Chicago, I trust God is doing a work in that whole environment. I don't know. I'm not their judge. But one of the satellite churches of this group have bought their facility for five point something million dollars, and that's going to help the mother church, the big one, reduce their debt load so that they can stay, still stay in favor with the banking institution. Isn't that a horrible thing? We're talking about the church of Jesus Christ. But false teachers are about show. They're, they're about the appearance. And folks aren't going to come to a church that has a gravel parking lot. You've got to pave that thing. I, you know, I, I'm going to try not to go further than I should go here. Because I realize at some point, we can all pick up stones, can't we? And start throwing them. That's not the point. But the point is this. Te false teachers who suppose that gain is godliness and so their m motivation is gain. And they use godliness as a front. At least an appearance of godliness. A form of godliness. They use God's name. They use religious symbols. They use religious language and it actually sounds like they believe what they're saying and maybe they are so duped that they do believe what they're saying but but they really know nothing they seek to sell their religious books and their re religious products it's did you know did you know that christianity or maybe we should say religion because it's not true biblical christianity but and it's not true religion but it is a multi-billion dollar industry. Are you aware of that? A multi-billion dollar industry. You see the things that come through the mail here that organizations are trying to sell to churches. And some of the churches are trying to sell. It would be disturbing to you. And of course, what comes to my mind in our day and age is what is known as prosperity preachers. Does that come to your mind? False teachers? This is why I'm saying this. Because a lot of false teachers say some convincing things. And they say some right things. And people are deceived by that. But whatever convincing things they may say, do not listen or respond to them if, they're, if you get the sense that their leading message is building their kingdom. As one person I saw interviewed recently, he was defending his Learjet and defending his 700 and some million dollar net worth. And his son is defending him too. And his name, is, his name is Kenneth Copeland. And I forget his son's name. And I say that because it's out there. And I say that because names are named in Scripture, aren't they? And that, that's kind of an easy one actually. But that man is... Mo and here's the thing. He presents gain as if it was godliness. These are God's blessings. I don't want to try to imitate him, but you know these are God's blessings to him. These are this is a the you know if oh I feel sorry for those preachers 
who are living in their poor 2,000 square foot houses. You know, uh, you know they, they, they could have more if they would just believe the truth. And I listen to that and I say, you are proud knowing nothing. Supposing that gain is godliness. As Paul said in Romans chapter 16. Again, I, I want us to be careful here because we can slip over into a, a similar pr problem here, and that is doting about or, <clears throat> or morbid craving for controversy here, even on this issue. You know, oh, you live in that kind of house. Or, oh, you live in... You understand what I'm saying? We can make that the issue. That is not the issue. The, the, is, the issue isn't what year vehicle do you drive. Well, I drive an older one than you. I'm more godly than you. You, you have just fallen into the trap. Measuring godliness by financial things. Good or bad. Okay? And he's going to make this... We're going to get into that discussion next week. Lord willing, but Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. There are people who are deceived by these kinds of teachers and preachers who are actually serving their own bellies and they're doing that on the backs of well-meaning, perhaps some Christians actually, but well-meaning people who believe they are doing the right thing and sending money to such teachers and organizations. Titus chapter 1. In verses 10 and 11, Paul says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, the Jews, the Judaizers, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. And why are they doing it? For filthy lucre's sake. That's what Paul is talking about here. These who are supposing that gain is godliness, or another way of rendering it is that godliness is being used as a means for gain. Some of the translations translate it that way. So sadly, many false teachers... I believe are convinced that riches are an evidence of godliness and they can't see clearly. They're blinded. There's a corruption in their minds. And when you're corrupted in your mind, you cannot see clearly. Jesus taught this. He taught this in the, in some ways, a very similar context. In, Ma in Matthew chapter 6, He says, "...where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." The light of, of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. So if you are seeing like you ought to see, if you're not diseased, if you're not proud, if, you're not, if your eyes aren't covered over by self-conceit, blinded, your whole body is full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. And so our cry ought to be, Oh, Lord Jesus, shine. Day star, rise. <laughs> Illuminate. I want your words. I, I want your truth. I want you. I want you to fill me so that I can see clearly. Not be deceived. And not be part of deception. False teachers don't see clearly and they're convinced that riches are an evidence of, evidence of godliness. And Paul is going to expose that error in the following verses. We'll get to that next week. So the instruction of this passage really helps us, I hope anyway, as we evaluate a teaching ministry. Summarize. 
does, if, as you're evaluating a ministry, and as you're evaluating someone in your life that you're engaging with, and you're, you're evaluating the merit of continuing in that relationship, that you can use these principles to evaluate. Does His ministry move us to worship God through Jesus Christ? Not just increase the database, you know, of information. Not just, wow, that was an interesting point. Wow, I never saw that before. Wow, you are so unique. I just want to sit at your feet. You know, are, are, you, are you finding that under the ministry of, as you listen to that person, you, 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 you have this sense that you are being moved toward God, godliness. Is he the person you're listening to or interacting with? Is he taken up with debates and division over technicalities? Well, that's not exactly what that. Oh, no, you know, there's a shade here. Oh, you're totally missing it. And that's all they want to deal with. And it has no bearing on godliness. I mean, Michael, Michael's not here. Michael, you can hear this, and y'all can hear it too. Did you hear how you read Psalm this morning? He said, yeah, instead of yay. Could you believe that? Man, that was horrible. I think we need to have an instruction class on how to pronounce those words correctly, or maybe I ought to just, well, maybe I shouldn't say too much more than that, but. But you understand? That doesn't affect in one iota my movement toward God and godliness because a word is mispronounced, but we can get hung up on those things. And maybe that's a shallow example, but we need to be careful. And then ask yourself, is there fruit in his own life? I mean, the person that you're listening to or engaging with, is there fruit in his own life? Is there fruit in his life? I mean, fruit of godliness. Not, he doesn't just talk about it. He demonstrates it. You see it. Not in a proud and arrogant way. And are those under his ministry and that he's... Do, do you sense that there is this spirit, this primary Spirit of concern about godliness in that teacher's life and in the ministry that he's involved in. Not fame, not money, not anything that is passing away. In other words, it, you kind of get the sense in that person's life, he gets it. This world is passing away. This world is passing away. He gets it. And he wants Jesus Christ more than anything else. And he wants those with whom he engages to have the same. False teachers are a genuine threat to the church of Jesus Christ. And it's important that they be identified. We must not listen to their cry of intolerance when we identify them. We must not be affected by accusations of being unloving when we withdraw from them. The glory of God in this world through the church is at stake. The glory of God in this world through the church is at stake. What is the most, whose opinion matters more than anyone else? Lord Jesus Christ, our head, the Lord Jesus Christ, draw near to him. That equals godliness, draw near to him. You cannot truly draw near to Christ and remain unaffected, unchanged. Amen. Oh, may the Lord continue to bless us here at community and may this be, continue to be the emphasis, godliness and the teaching and kind of ministry that promotes godliness. Father, I pray that you would bless.